Good evening, everyone. Um, kind of bring you up to speed. Last week we took a turn because I needed to explain, felt like I needed to expound on some other things, or uh, well, some things that we went over previously. And uh, I don't know if you remember, but before that, we were dealing with the name. And I also told you that uh, your name is important, right? Because it's your address. Blessings come to you, right? So it's your address. Your name is your address. Not only is the word that one speaks is important, but the source or the name that is attached to or the source that it comes from is just as important. Your name, all right? So now I want to start with the about the name today, all right? And we're going to get into addresses, whatever we can get into. But I uh, want to start off, we'll talk about how reverence is your name when it comes to the spiritual customs center in the air, all right? And you remember we are talking about Ephesians 6 and 12, and I said that's a spiritual custom system. Saying his system is trying to block your blessings and things that are supposed to come to you, right? So it's a custom system, all right? So to get started, let's talk about the process of becoming a great name, all right? It's a process. Let's go to Genesis chapter 2, I mean Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. I know you probably never read in Genesis before. <laughs> Just say amen when you get there. Genesis chapter 12, verse 2. The process of becoming a great name. Can you hear me good? Mm-hmm. All right. Loud and crisp. I'll try not to holler tonight. Are we ready? Yeah. All right. And we know this verse, right? And it reads, it says, And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee, and I will make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. Now, he's talking about setting Abraham's name apart, distinguished, set apart, a great name. Can I be honest with you, though? God never calls you to him. To have an average name or to be average. But he always calls you to have a great name and to be great. All right? I say again, God never calls you to him. When he calls you for salvation, he didn't call you to be average. He didn't call you to have an average name. But he called you to be great and to have a great name. Are you with me so far? All right? Now, think about it here. Abram to Abraham. And we'll get to that in a minute. Now, Abram. His name was already Abraham in God's mind. It was history in God's mind. But I want to show you, to man, it's a process. God never calls you what you are. He always calls you what you become. Mm -hmm. Oh, dear. I say again, God never calls you what you are. He always calls you what you become. Why? Because he sees what you are. He sees your future. He knows your future. I say again, he never calls you what you are. In his mind, it's history. Abraham, it was already Abraham. It's history in God's mind. Yeah. And that's why it says you call those things that be not what? As though they were. Exactly. It's history in his mind. So in his name, Abram, was already great. He was already looked at as Abraham, but it was a process. Are you still with me here? Now, think about it. In Philippians 2 and 9, you don't have to go there, right? He talks about Jesus. He said how he highly exalted him and gave him a name above every name. But Jesus' name was already great. It was already great. But it's a process. Think about it here. Luke 2 and and 52, I think, I believe. He says Jesus grew, right, in stature, in wisdom, right, in favor with man. That was a process. He grew physically. He grew in wisdom. He grew in favor with men. Can I tell you something? Whenever you have favor with God, you automatically have favor with men. Uh-huh. But it's a process. His name was always great, all right? Already great. But it was a process that has to be known to men. You want to go a process. Stay with me here. Oh, boy. Now, let's... Should I go there? Where do I want to go to next? Now, when we talk about Jesus here, let me... Show you something else. I don't want to take it too fast. Think of it this way. 
his first year of ministry was an introduction, year of introduction, right? His second year of ministry was a year of popularity. His third year of ministry was opposition. You see the process. He could not face opposition if he didn't first become popular. I'm saying he was already great. But I'm trying to show you in the mind of man, it's a process. It's a process to have a great name. Even though I told you, right? Even though your names are written in heaven, you're already great to God, right? But demons must come to know your name. We'll get to that point. You understand? Your name is already great. Abraham's name is already great. But there's still a process that you must undergo. You remember when the 70, I told you, right? When they were casting out demons, all right? When they came back to Jesus and they said, we cast even the demons were subject to us in your name. What did I tell you? That was the beginning of the process of their name becoming known to the spiritual world and demons. It was already registered in heaven. It was already known to God. But that was the process that they began. So their, known, their name could become known to demons in the spiritual world or in this custom system. Are oh, you with me so far? Am I losing anyone? All right, I'm trying to. Let's go to Genesis chapter 17, verse 4 through 5. Just say amen when you get there. Mm -hmm. He says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. Now, God is already just announcing here what he already confirmed in Genesis 15, that his covenant was with Abraham. Do you remember when Abraham cut the animal pieces in half, right? And God passed through, right? They had made a God and made a covenant with him then. But now he's telling them, he says, as for me, behold, my covenant is with thee. And thou shalt be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham. For a father of many nations have I made thee. So he's no longer the high exalted father of Abram. But now he becomes. You see the process? Now he becomes. Yeah. Even though he was in God's mind, his name becomes. Now he's high, a father of many nations. You see the process? Now think about it here. Once God speaks concerning a name, once he speaks concerning a name, it's already done. In the real world, we go through a process if we want to legally change our name. We submit paperwork. We put things on file, right? But whenever God speaks concerning the name, the paperwork is already on file and it's already considered as done. Amen. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Now, think about this here. Abraham's name changed. It became, right? It's a process. He still had to become known to man. Think about it. What song do we sing today? Father Abraham has many sons. What? And I am one of them. We don't say Father Abraham. Why? Because that name was not exalted. But it was Abraham who was exalted. Wow. Mm -hmm. Now, let's go a little further here. Think about it this way. Abram to Abraham. If you knew a senator that's in your district, it's quite possible that only the people within that district are not knows that senator, all right? Maybe the other district, they know nothing about this woman or, 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 or guy, but only the people in his district knows his name. Now, let's say he begins, he wants to run for president, or he or she, right? Now, as they begin to run for another office, they become a little famous. But once they become president, if they make president, their name becomes distinguished and set apart. They become an exalted or a great name. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. And that's what I'm telling you. Even though your name is already great, there's a process that you must undergo. So spiritual forces know your name. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. All right, let me go on here. Now. Let's go to Genesis 13, verse 2. Don't fall asleep on me now. Genesis chapter 13, verse 2.
Over there. Mm -hmm. All right, real quickly. And it reads, And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. Why did I go there? Because I wanted, you to I wanted to show you that this was a man who worked in blessing. In blessing. The blessing of God was upon him. No spiritual forces could withheld anything that was coming to him. Everything that he had come to him came to him. Even after his death, get what the blessing still went on. Why? Because we are the seed of Abraham. Do you understand? It went through the Abrahamic covenant. Why do you think they got to inherit the land? Why? Because this man was blessed and his name was great. Oh, boy. Oh, we still there. Now, where I want to go, man? I got so much I want to give you. <laughs> Try not to take you too fast here. But he was blessed. It said he was rich in silver and gold and livestock. He had it all. My question is, why don't Christians have it all? Simply because the spiritual forces are getting into their blessings. They're being stopped or blocked at customs. Oh. Spiritual forces in the air. Uh -huh. Or you're still there. Question, are you a seed of Abraham? So the blessing is upon you. So why are you not blessed? Why are you missing out on certain things in your life? Why? Because the spiritual forces love to intercept what rightfully belongs to you. Remember I told you, if you order something online, all right? Now you have an address that it comes to, right? Even though you ordered it, it could be held up in customs, depending on where it's coming from. And that's what they're doing to Christians today. And that's exactly what they're doing today. They're holding up things that rightly belong to you from coming to you. From coming to you, you, which is your address. Oh, we're still there. Mm -hmm. All right. Let me go on here. Let's talk about a distinguished name or address depends on how quickly you receive your package. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. been here before. Mm -hmm. Oh dear. I'm going to read from the Amplified once again. And it says, for our struggle is not against flesh and blood, contending with only physical opponents, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now it gives us a list of different classes of demons. It's so much I can really go into that, but it gives you different classes. Now, this is not the only classes of demons or devils, all right? This is not the only class. I don't want to go there right now, but I just want to throw it out there for free. But it's given us class, different classes. If you read it, it's different classes, all right? Now, why did I go there? We said that was a spiritual customs. Now, think about it. If President Biden or Trump, whoever you want to say, Obama, whoever, I don't really care, but the thing is, if they ordered something, think about it. If they ordered something and it was coming from another country, because of their name, it would never get <coughs> held up in customs. Yes. Uh -huh. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. I say again, because their name is set apart, because it is exalted, it is distinguished just as Abraham's. Mm -hmm. It is set apart. Yeah. If they ordered something because the name on the package, do you understand what I'm saying? The name on the package, their item would not be held up in customs. In fact, it would probably come to them speedily. If it wasn't the president, he may have some trouble with his package getting through customs, as some of us do today. Yeah. Even in the physical realm and in the spiritual <laughs> realm. So if that's the case, that may be the case why many Christians are not receiving what rightfully belongs to them because of their name is not respected among the spiritual wow. forces. Now you see why I was talking about yep. the name. That's why I say not only the words that you speak, but the source or the name that that word comes from is important. I said, when you are exalted, also your name is already exalted. It has to follow the same protocol. 
When they exalted Jesus, his name was already exalted. When they exalted Abraham, his name was already exalted. It had to follow the same protocol. Can you see that, though? All right. Just thought I'd throw that up for free. Now, in that same verse in Ephesians, I want to talk about defeating these opponents makes your name reverence. Now, we know these are spiritual forces that we just outlined in Ephesians 6 and 12. They're spiritual forces. Now, think about it. If people know you, let's say you went to school, right? Let's say you really didn't know how to fight. People picked on you all the time. They can push you around. They can bully you. Bam, boom, whatever they wanted to do to you. And you never did anything. Now, even though they know your name, they don't respect your name because why? You can never defeat them. That's the same way those are spiritual forces. If you cannot defeat them or you know not how to defeat them, they will never respect your name. Are oh, you still there? Until that day you knock that bully out. Yeah, but the problem is, that's true. Many Christians never knock the bully out. That's true. They wonder why they're going through so many different things, but they never knock the bully out. See, the thing is, whenever you're going through something, whenever you're experiencing something, it's all right if you get knocked down. But you must get back up. When I first really started dealing with devils and demons, do you remember how many times I tried to cast out a spirit before I actually succeeded? Succeeded? Many times. But I would never quit. I would never quit. Never quit. And that's what I'm saying. It doesn't matter how many times you get knocked down. But you must get back up to live to fight another Come on. day. Oh, you with me? Same in the physical world, same in the world of the realm of the spirit. Are oh, we still there? Mm -hmm. All right. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 12. I'm going to go through a little phase, and we're going to come right back to where I started here. Talking about defeating the opponents makes your name reverence. But I see some other stuff that I couldn't. Could not not teach you to bring up. <laughs> but does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. They don't respect you if you can't defeat them in, ba in battle. Yeah, they know your name, right? Your name is written in heaven. Yeah, we know that. But they don't respect you. They have no reason to respect you. Because they know that you cannot defeat their kind. When you've been given power. As Jesus said, I've given you power to tread upon all servants, all the all ability of power of the enemy. Anything that he can do, I've given you authority. I've given you ability over. But I told you before, what's the use of having power and ability if you don't know how to use it? Right? Mm -hmm. Just as I said before, if you had a sword, right? That doesn't make you dangerous. But if you know how to use a sword and swing the sword and you've got the guts to, that's what makes you dangerous. But we're still there. All right, let me get back there here. All right, Acts chapter 19, verses 11 through 12. Stay with me here. It says, and God wrought. I mean, he, this is a work. He's, he's doing something, all right? Special miracles by the hands of Paul. It says, so that from his body were brought unto the sick handkerchiefs or aprons, and the disease departed from them, and the evil spirits went out upon them. Now, think about it. Aprons, handkerchiefs. We'll get to the anointing transfer to those. But why could the anointing on an object or an apron, how could this anointing, how, how, how did the demons really know about this anointing? Why? Because they knew Paul's name. They were familiar with his name. Can I be honest? They were familiar with the anointing that was resonating within Paul. Paul didn't have to touch him, but they knew his name. They were familiar with his name. And that's why, from those aprons, the anointing that was transferred, they knew that it was Paul anointing. And they knew they had no choice but to go. Oh, you're still there. Mm -hmm. All right, let me go a little further here. Now, the handkerchiefs. The handkerchiefs. The handkerchiefs didn't believe in what they were doing. In fact, they didn't even know what they were doing. They were actually ministering to the sick. Can I go a little further? Many believers don't even know. Many believers don't even believe in healing. But can I be honest with you? If the anointing is upon you, if you've been at some type of meeting, 
and the anointing is upon you. You can leave that meeting not believing and you can go hug somebody at a hospital and you can heal them. Why do I say that? Why? Because an object, an apron, he apron didn't believe, a handkerchief didn't believe. It didn't believe. It didn't know what it was doing. But it had the anointing. It was saturated with the anointing. Right? And as it touched the sick people, the demons left the people. All right. So it's the same thing for you. You're an object. You are what is a noun. Place and person. Thing. It's an object. All right? That was an object. You are an object. So you may not believe, but because of the anointing has saturated your clothing, you just touch somebody and they can be healed without you even believing. Just as the handkerchiefs didn't believe. Oh, you're still there. Many Christians don't think like that, though. The aprons. Why do you think people now pray over aprons or handkerchiefs? See, it's actually not so much the prayer, <laughs> but it's the anointing that is on that man or woman of God, which is transferred into the handkerchiefs. Saturated with that anointing. Oh boy. Are you still there? Mm -hmm. Now, think about it. He says he wrought special miracles by Paul. And that means they had never seen this type of miracle before. They seen Jesus casting out demons through the gospel. They seen him making the blind see, making the deaf talk, making the dumb, I mean the deaf hear. They seen that. But he says, aprons. A new thing. Nobody has ever did this before. Yeah. And that's why it says you wrought special, I mean special miracles by Paul. Stay with me here. We're going to get back to it. I just, I, I couldn't refuse this, all right? Now, can I show you something else here? We're, we're just going on. This reminds me of another miracle. But to tell this one, I want to go to Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. I promise you, you'll like it. We're just going to start here. Stay with me. Hebrews chapter 10. Verse 1. The shadow. Another unusual, unusual miracle. That's what I want to talk about here. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. Just say amen when you get there. Amen. I'm going to read from the Amplified. Y'all quiet on me today. <laughs> We're there? Okay. Read from the Amplified. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 1. I promise you, you'll love it all. Just soak it up and give it to someone else. It says, For since the law was only a shadow. Now, the Greek word there is skia. Now, here it means uh, an outline or a sketch. All right? A sketch. All right? So that's, that's what it's saying here. It says it's just a pale representation of the good things to come. It says, Not the very image of those things. It said it can never by offering the same sacrifices continually year after year make perfect those who approach its altars. Now, the law, would you agree with me if I told you, right, that it was the extension of God's nature? Even though it can never make man perfect. Why? Because the law kept man in a constant state of death. They were spiritually dead. No matter how many times those sacrifices year after year, they were still in a constant state of death. Why? Because Christ is the only one that can make one alive. Now, even though this was the shadow, it was the shadow. Stay with me here. Even though it was the shadow of the things to come, it was a representation of the things to come. It still carried the very presence of God. Would you agree to that? Mm -hmm. Oh boy, you're quiet on me. Oh boy. Now. Oh boy, where do I want to go here? Stay with me, shadow. Let's go to uh, John chapter 3, verses 14 through 15. Hold that thought, shadow. And hold the thought that it carries the presence of God. Yep. It carries. Even though it was just a shadow, it was a representation. It was just a shadow, but it still carried the very healing power of God. Are oh, you with me? Mm -hmm. All right. John chapter 3, verse 14 through 15. It says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up. It said that whatsoever believeth in him 
That whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. That's what you're reading? Mm -hmm. Now, Moses on the pole, Christ on the pole. The serpent was not a type of Christ. But the idea of the serpent being on a pole was a type of Christ. Why? Because everybody that was bitten, he said, if you look into, if you look into, if you look into this representation, this shadow of Christ, this type of Christ, he says, everyone will be healed and begin to live. Now, if we look to Christ, those that look to Christ, they looked up on the cross. He said, I'll be lifted up. I'll draw all men to me. If I be lifted up on the cross, on the pole, on the altar, if you want to say. So that's a type of Christ. So just like Christ carried that power on the cross, this, this pole that the serpent was on carried the same power. But it's a shadow or it's a type of Christ. Oh, you're still there. All right. Let me go on again. Let's see if I can bore him here. Now, it was a sketch, right? Or an outline. Now, let's go to Acts chapter 5, verse 14 through 15. Acts chapter 5, verses 14 through 15. Just say amen when you get there. Amen. Now I think you'll see where I was going. Over there. All right. It says, And believers were the more added to the Lord. It says, Multitude, both men and women, and so much that they brought forth the sick unto the streets. Oh dear. And it says, Lay them on beds, beds and couches. It says that at least the what? Shadow. Oh boy. A Peter passing might overshadow some of them. Can you see that? <laughs> so in Hebrews 10 and 1, if the shadow still carried the presence of God, this is a man's shadow, meaning an object, all right? It, it, it is a representation of an object. It takes on the form of that object. It's not the real thing, but it takes on the form of that object. If that was a shadow, if the serpent on the pole was a shadow or type of Christ, no wonder why the anointing can transfer from Peter to his shadow and people become healed. Can you see that? Because it carries the very presence of God. The very presence of God. The very presence of God. I've seen it in a meeting, in a Pastor Chris meeting. I've seen it. I've seen him come by. And he, he tells them, he says, watch my shadow. And as soon as the shadow comes out, they fall under. They fall under. Simple like that, fall under. I ain't talking about pushing nobody over like we see around here and stuff. But it falls over. Just fall over at the anointing. The shadow. It carries the very presence of God. Oh, boy. I just thought I'd throw it in there for free. It's an image. That's why. It's the image of The image. But it carries the presence. Yes. Just like the law. The presence of God. Oh, boy. That's powerful. Anyways, I'll go on. Now, Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. I just had to throw that in there for free. Just say amen when you get there. 19 what? Acts chapter 19, verses 13 through 16. <laughs> Over there. Mm -hmm. All right. It says, Then certain of the Babylon Jews, the exorcists, it says, took upon them to call over them which had evil spirits. It says, The name of the Lord Jesus, saying, We adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preached. <laughs> I wonder why they didn't say their father, his sons, the scabbard. Why? Because their father was a priest, but that's another day story. But they say, By whom Paul preaches. All right? Now it says, We're due you, we're due you by Jesus whom Paul preached. It says, And there were seven sons of Sceva. It says, A Jew and a chief of the priests, which did also. So they did the same thing. And it says, And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are you? I mean, who are ye? It says, and, and the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled 
out of that house naked and wounded. I told you before, when Jesus sinned, use the name. You come in his name. They said, I, I, I drew you by who Paul preaches. They didn't understand the name. It doesn't matter if you use a name. It doesn't mean that a demon will come out because you use the name. That's why I tell you, it's something deeper than that. I tell you, he's speaking from a place or location. We'll get there in a minute. But you see, these demons, they said, I know Paul. Jesus I know. Paul I know. You see the importance of a name. The demons knew his name. But the question is, do they know yours? They knew his name. Jesus I know. Paul I know. But who are you? That's what the spiritual forces and customs and other ranks and all that, that's what they're asking many Christians today. Who are you? I understand that your name is written in heaven, but who are you? Why should I be scared of you? Why should I reverence your name? Why should I respect your name? Who are you? They didn't respect their name. And I can take it, maybe these were going to be Christians. Their father was a priest, the sons of Scam. But he says, he, he says uh, who are you? Now that's why I tell you the importance of a name. That's why you must build a reputation for your name. I was always told as a kid, you must have a good name, yeah. son. Yeah. A good name. And I live by that today. A good name. Why? Because it's like credit. It's like having good credit. A good name. But can you see the importance of your name? They didn't understand how to use the name of Jesus. Why? Because they didn't come in the name. They didn't come as a representative. This was happening to many Christians today. Yeah, you can use a name, but you must come in the name as a representative that he is. Come in the name, not use the name. That's what I was telling you last time. It ain't about, oh, in the name of Jesus. See, a demon knows if you're coming from the name or not. Yeah, come on. He knew that they were not coming from the name. Yeah. Oh, you're still there. Yeah. So I just say, just because you're saying, don't mean that the demon, demon will obey you. Oh, boy, how much time? You're all right. How do they know Paul's name? Because he dealt with these evil spirits before. And that's why I told you when the 70 went out, they begin the process, right? They begin the process of letting the demons know their name. Oh, boy, y'all quiet on me today. Y'all making me work. Oh, dear. Now, evil spirits will manifest for these three reasons. Are we still in Acts, what, 19, right? Let's read uh, verses 14 through 16. Evil spirits will manifest for these three reasons. We're going to go to three different sets of verses. All right, and I'll read this out to you. Acts chapter 19, verses 14 through 16, which we just kind of read, right? But I'm going to just reiterate it and give you a point. And there were seven sons of Sceva, a Jew and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed them, I mean, prevailed against them. So that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. Now, he'll manifest for that reason when he knows that you're not functioning or reaching him in the realm in which you reside in. When he knows that you cannot touch me. And in fact, you remember playing the game, Nan, Nanny, Boo Boo, you can't get me, right? Sounds so crazy and simple, but it's true. That's the game that they play. That's the game that they play with many anointed people, many Christians. Are you with me? They manifest. Why? He manifested and he told him. He says, there's nothing you can do to me. He manifested to him and he said, hey, what can you do with me? He knew that you could not, he could not touch him. He knew that that man could not, or those people could not do anything to him. So he manifests himself. And he teases him. Nan, 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 you can't get me. You cannot touch me. There's nothing you can do. Can you see that? They manifest for that reason. When they know that a person is not functioning in the spiritual realm or the part that they're supposed to function in. When they know that they're not come really as a true representative. Not that you're not a representative, but as a true representative. Meaning, you know how to use the name. You know how to call from a spiritual location, as we'll get to in a minute. That's when they'll manifest. They'll tease you. It's just like if a dog was trying to get you, you know, the other side of the fence, and you're like, eh, you can't. the dog can do nothing to you. So now you're messing with the dog. Yeah. It's the same way that a demon does. Why? Because it knows. 
it knows that it lives in a different realm. And you have to function in that realm in oh, order to make yeah. contact or reach that spirit. Wow. Are you with me? Yeah. All right, number two. Let's go to Mark chapter 9, verses 25 through 26. Repeat it. Mark chapter 5, I mean, Mark chapter 9, verses 25 through 26. Just say amen when you get there. Can you still hear me? Okay. Mark chapter 9, verses 25 through 26. It says, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou, deaf, thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him. Did he say in my name, come out of him? Did he say in my name, come out of him? He said, come out of him, right? right. Okay. Paul says, we'll show, I'll show you an example of what Paul says in the name of Jesus. But I'll show you he was speaking about somewhere else. All right. Now, he says, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And listen to this. Look at this. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him. And he was as one dead, and so much that many said, he is dead. Number two, why did that demon manifest itself? That's epilepsy. Number two, he knew that a man with authority was on the scene. That's right. He knew that a man knew how to reach over into the other realm to communicate with the demons. He knew that this was going to be his last time to convulse with this boy. Why? Because he was about to receive his eviction notice and he was about to, have to come out off of a private property, if you will. In other words, Jesus was saying, this is private property. He said, I'm about to give you a, your eviction notice. And the demon knew that. So he manifested himself one little good last time so he can make the boy seize or have epilepsy because he knew after that he would not be able to enter into the boy any longer. Can you see that? He knew. He knew what a man. Demons know your name. They know your name. Mm -hmm. Are you with me? Mm -hmm. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right. Number three. Let's go to Mark chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Mark chapter 5, verses 7 through 10. Say amen when we get there. Amen. And cried with a loud voice and said, this man says, uh, we are many, right, Legion? All right. He says, what have I to do with thee, Jesus, thou son of the most high God? He says, I adjure thee by God. That's what you're reading? Mm -hmm. All right. He says, that thou torment me not. Why? Because it's a torment that they, time when they be tormented, all right? But it wasn't that time. He says, for he said unto him, Come out of the man. You see that? Come out. He says, thou unclean what? Spirit. He says, and he asked him, what is thy name? He says, uh-oh. <laughs> he says, and he says, he answered saying, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he besought him much that he would not send them away out of the country. Now, when he says, what is thy name? And I've said it before. He says, uh-oh, he knows that I'm here. Uh -huh. Why? Because a demon lives in another realm, as I said before. And sometimes they act like they don't hear you. Unless you make contact with that spirit. And when Jesus said, what is your name? He says, uh-oh, like I said, he knows that I'm here. But he made contact with the spirit. Now, demons, he said, he asked them not to send them out of the region. They'll manifest and talk to you. Sometimes they'll talk through a person. Sometimes you can hear them in the realm of the spirit that no one else can hear. They'll be talking. All right? So that's what we must understand. He asked him, he says, give me permission to go in the swine. He says, don't make us leave out of the country. What does that mean? We'll get to this point later. But that means certain, ge oh boy, certain demons are assigned to certain geographical regions. Are you with me? But can you see? He manifested himself. Once again, he knew that a man could make contact with him. But he says, I know that you're there. Uh oh. He knew. Can you see that? Mm -hmm. All right, I better go on here. Look like you're falling asleep on me. Now, let's talk about this. You can only defeat spiritual forces by speaking from two spiritual geographical locations. Acts chapter 16, 
verse 18. Chapter 16, verse 18. Amen. Say amen when you get there. Amen. amen. Let's look at old Apostle Paul. And this did she many days, talking about the lady with the spirit, all right? Uh, but Paul, being grieved, turned us and said to the spirit, I command thee what in the name of Jesus of Christ, I mean Jesus Christ, to come out of her. And he came out that same hour. Now, you read this, he said, well, yeah, you use a name. Yeah. Paul did say, in the name of Jesus. But you really don't see Paul was speaking from two locations. He was speaking from in Christ. Why? Because Ephesians 2 and 6 said, we're seated what? In Christ, in heavenly realms. We are in him. Paul was his representative. He came in his name. You see, he said the name, but you don't see where he spoke from. You speak from two geographical locations. That means in him or from his name, and you speak into or from the realm in which they reside in. Are you with me? Two locations. He spoke from his name because we're in Jesus. See, using the name of Jesus is a spiritual location. Why? Because you are sitting in him in heavenly places. You are in him. You are representative of him. Doesn't mean to use the name of Jesus, but you're speaking from a spiritual location, a geographical location in him or from his name. All we see is he says in the name, but he's speaking from a place. Why? Because Paul understood it. He understood it. I say again, he was speaking from a place, two ge geographical locations, from him or in his name. And then he was speaking from the realm or into the realm in which the demon functioned from. But he was able to make contact with that spirit. Are you with me? Does it make sense? And that's why I try to tell you, use the name, use the name. In the name of Jesus, it doesn't guarantee you that the demon is going to leave. But I ask you a question. What name did you come in? You remember I told you, does UPS go deliver a package, right? It says, I come to deliver the package in the name of UPS or USPS? No. Because of that name on that uniform, because of the crest on that uniform, because of the van or the, uh, whatever they're driving pulls up, you know that they come to deliver as a representative of USPS, USPS, the Postal Service, UPS, FedEx, DHL, whatever you want. You know that they're a representative. That's what demons must know. They must know that you're a representative mm -hmm. of Jesus. Oh, I better go on. Can you see that? Yeah. Question. Who did Jesus cast demons out as? Man or God? Acts chapter 10, 38. Whom did Jesus cast demons out as? God or man? Acts chapter 10, verse 38. I'm going to read from the Amplified Classic here. Are we there? Mm -hmm. It says how God anointed and consecrated Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with strength and ability and power. How he went about doing good and in particular curing all who were harassed and oppressed by the power of the devil. For God was with him. And when it usually says Jesus of Nazareth, number one, when you talk about when you mention Jesus, you talk about his humanity or who he was. When you say Christ, you're talking about his office. When you say Lord, you're talking about his title. But he says Jesus of Nazareth. He's giving you a side of his humanity. He said Jesus of Nazareth. Just like say Sister Susan from West Columbia. Pastor Brazil from Wild Beach. Or Oklahoma. <laughs> but it's, it's, it's tying you to a place. It's giving you a geographical location. He's letting you know that I anointed a man named Jesus. I'm talking about his humanity. Are you with me? Oh, boy. Now, think about it. He could not cast them out as God. But he cast them out as a man, Jesus of Nazareth. See, the hypostatic union tells us, it says that he was 100% what God and 100% man, and it never interfered with each other. 
Sometimes if you study the scriptures, you'll realize that Jesus spoke. Jesus the man, or when Jesus God spoke. There's a difference. Even though I call it part of his uh, earth, uh, priestly ministry, earth priestly ministry, when he forget his sins, who was he speaking at? Jesus God. When he cast out demons and things of like that, and when he spoke and he says, come out, what is the more? I mean, Matthew 8 and 16 say he cast out spirits by what? His words. Who did he speak as? God or man? Jesus of Nazareth. You must understand, right? I think 1 Corinthians 12, it tells us that we were given uh, gifts what by the Holy Spirit, right? And then it tells us in the Bible that all gifts come from who? God, right? So think about it. He could not cast them out as God. Why? Because God is not gifted. He's not gifted. Man is gifted. The minute that we say that God is gifted, that means somebody else gave it to him. Why? Because man gives a gift. Right? We get gifts. He's gifted us. He's gifted us with the Holy Spirit, right? He's gifted us with all these different uh casting out demons, all this and that. Uh different uh different uh uh, things that we can do in First Corinthians, I mean First Corinthians 12, all right? Some speak in tongues, all right? Some have the word of knowledge. Some have faith. You know, all that type of stuff. The minute that we say that God is gifted, which is untrue, we're saying somebody gave it to him. He has no date of existence. Do you understand? He was. He was. He says, I am. He was. The gifts of him, they are intrinsic, all right? They are intrinsic, all right? They are natural, but he gifted it to us. That's why Jesus could not cast it out as God, because God is not gifted. But Jesus became gifted. How? As a man. Oh, boy. It's hard for some of you to swallow. I say again, God is not gifted. The minute that we say he's gifted, we're saying somebody gave him something. When you give a gift, what did you get it from? Somebody gave it to you. Nobody gave God anything. He was. Oh dear. That's a pill hard for you to swallow. <laughs> I like that. How can you say he's gifted? Who gave it to him? If you want to say he's a father of gifts because they're natural. Everything is in him, but he gave it to you. Oh, dear Lord. <laughs> oh, dear Lord, I love it. Now, think about it. Ephesians 2 and 6 says, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. Think about this. As a man, Jesus of Nazareth, He's seated in heavenly places. As Christ, he's seated in heavenly places. So it don't matter. He didn't have to say in the name of Jesus. Why? Because he was speaking from a spiritual geographical location. In him. In him. Are you still there? <laughs> oh, dear Lord. 758. Mm, mm, mm. How much time? Was 758? Oh, dear Lord. I don't think I'm going to have time. Hmm. Yeah, I'm not going to have time here. Let's start on this. Let's do one more real quick. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. 1 John chapter 3, verse 8. I'll call it quits. What did you say? First John chapter 3, verse 8. I'll just finish it up next week. Just say amen when you get there. Amen. amen. Now, it says, He that committed sin is of the devil. It's for the devil sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Now, we're talking about demons and names and all that type of stuff. 
He said, he sinned from the beginning. So if the devil never sinned from the beginning, Jesus would have no reason to come. He would have no reason to come. How did he sin from the beginning? Well, we know he had pride in his heart. Mm -hmm. He had pride. He had idolatry. Why? Because he exalted himself in his mind above God. He worshipped himself. He elevated himself, even though he was elevated. But he elevated himself out of pride. He sinned from the beginning. The Bible tells us he was a murderer from the beginning. Well, how was he a murderer from the beginning? He was a mastermind, all right? Or you can charge him with whatever crime you want. Why? Because he spiritually killed God's creation in the garden when they ate. He enticed them and they ate and the whole creation of man died. So he's a murderer from the beginning. Are you with me? But if Satan never unleashed his demonic forces, if he never got man to commit sin or his works, he says the works of the devil, if he never did his work of making man commit sin, or if he never did his work unleashing his demons into man, why would Jesus have to come? So just as he unleashed his demons, they came in who? Satan's name. And we come in who? Jesus' name. Oh, I wish I could get into it here. I'll stop right there. I'll leave it alone. I'll, I'll, I'll come back next week. Try to finish it up, all right? Because we got, we got to go on some other stuff. But, uh, oh, dear. Man, I really want to keep going. But <laughs> I'll say this one little piece. If Satan, if Jesus had to manifest, Let me put it this way. Jesus said, I came down from heaven. Right? So he came from a supernatural place. He had a supernatural birth in order to get supernatural results. Mm -hmm. So if he got supernatural results, that means the work of Satan must be supernatural for him to come and undo it. Are you with me? I'll leave you on that cliffhanger. We'll pick it up next week. Hey, we pray real quick. <laughs> Our Father, we just thank you right now, Lord. We thank you for the word, Lord. I thank you for each and every soul in here, Lord. We thank you that they're blessed. We thank you that they're prosperous. We thank you that they're healthy. We thank you that no sickness can befall them. No disease, no corona, no COVID-19. Lord, I cancel that assignment over the enemy right now. Lord, I thank you. I declare and decree that they're free. Lord, they can walk in any place, Lord Jesus. And they can kill germs because of what they carry inside of them. Lord, I thank you for the rest of this week. I thank you for a blessed week. I thank you that we have certain <coughs> graces we come to and fro. We thank you that you love us when we don't love ourselves, Lord. We thank you for you being you, God. And we thank you for seeing the best in us. In Jesus' name we say, Amen. Amen. Man, I wish I could get into some more. So,